So uh, today, uh, my name's Larry Edelstein. Uh, I'm here with, with John uh, Wusan. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, we're from Perforce Software, and uh, I'm looking forward to showing you uh, about TotalView and how you can use TotalView with your work. John and I are both going to be demoing different parts of the product for you. Uh, we'll, uh, we should be able to answer some questions as well. And after this presentation, uh, I hope that uh, you'll take our contact information, which uh, which will be here in the presentation, and, and Wusan should also be able to give you, and, and contact us because we really want to work with the folks who are at who are building software uh, and running simulations at NERSC and who are grappling with uh, with the pro the the difficult problems uh, debugging their these your gigantic simulations and. We, we want to work with you and help you use our product and help you succeed. So please get in touch with us. As for Perforce, uh, so, uh, you know, we've got, we've got lots of pretty, pretty diagrams that show what we, what we, uh, what we do. Uh, we try to, we try to, to cover all of the DevOps process. Uh, I think this is particularly relevant for product teams that are developing products that are shipping out to the field, but also for, the, the teams in scientific applications who have uh, a well-defined process, the, uh, who have who use continuous integration to to test their changes uh, shortly there shortly after they're made and checked in, uh, and uh, Perforce is here to to support you all through that cycle. Uh, we uh, Perforce has uh, a, a wide array of products that we can bring to bear against your development challenges. Uh, they, the, we have, uh, we, I think we organize them into these four rough, uh, pillars. I think we call them, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but I'm just going to note that in the, that in, uh, the automated testing area there, uh, we've got tools for static analysis, like clockwork and Helix QAC, which can take a look at your program, analyze it without running it, analyze every code path that it, uh, can see there and look for common errors, uh, we have code libraries that you may find useful uh, in the application management and components section there, uh, including IMSL, which is a, a really battle-hardened and time-tested set of mathematical and statistical uh, uh, function, uh, functionality that is available for C, for C and C++, for Fortran, for Java, and for Python. Uh, and there are more more products as you can see on this uh, on this slide here so there's a lot but the one that we want to talk about today is total view of course uh i have let, let me give you uh I'm, I'm going to go through this part really quickly here the we uh i've uploaded uh, and busan has a, a collection of uh, some some lab software so some software that you can use to get yourself a little more familiar with total view there are some exercises there that you can go through they're pretty simple and we're growing that uh we're, we're growing those labs i hope to add one for python debugging in the near future um the, there is a i have a the, there are a few of these labs exist right now i don't think that we have everything in our latest format in, in this slide here uh so i'm gonna go past this quickly but we do have uh, software. We do have this resource that you should be able to use. And uh, again, you'll have our uh, contact information after this, and I hope that you'll use it to ask us questions about it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about TotalView. So uh, TotalView is here to help you analyze what your program is doing while it's running. Uh, you well, you're undoubtedly going to use it uh, uh, not when everything is working, but when everything is broken, when your program isn't working, when it's crashing, when it's not behaving correctly, when you're running out of memory, when you're when you're not seeing the communication that you want to see between your various processes. Uh, we do find it useful, though it is. We do call it, besides being a debugger, it is a dynamic analysis tool, and it, it, it can be very useful useful for not just uh, fixing bugs, but for figuring out what your code does. Uh, you can, and hope, hope that uh, what I do will illustrate some of that. Uh, it's, uh, it's got a lot of functionality. You know, we, we, it is built to support 
uh, debugging the largest, uh, most uh, complex and, and widely distributed, widely multi-process and multi-thread programs in the world. Uh, it supports the latest versions of C, C++, and Fortran. You've got a great deal of control over your processes and threads, where, where you set breakpoints, how, uh, how wide, uh, uh, how, how widely a breakpoint affects your program, whether it affects a single thread, a single process, all processes. Uh, we have conversions for the most for many of the important data types. The the for instance the C plus plus collection data types. Uh, if you want to visualize those, you know that those uh, the C plus plus collections are implemented in different ways based on on different platforms, and the, their implementations are usually complex if you look at them through a debugger. But we make them nice and simple. Uh, we support the, all of the parallel technologies that I think that you're going to want to use, uh, MPI, uh, uh, CUDA, Rockham, OpenMP, uh, and combinations of these uh, technologies. Uh, you can use TotalView directly on your own desktop. You can use it on Perlmutter. You can connect to Perlmutter from your desktop. Uh, you've got uh, lots of options there. If you have Python codes that use C++, you can debug a mixed C++ and Python application. Uh, I'm gonna, gonna give a caveat there that we don't have full Python debugging yet. Uh, the, the, you're able to see Python stack frames if you're stepping through uh, a combined Python and C++ or combined Python and Fortran application. Uh, actually, I'm not, uh, uh, well, a, a Python and C or C++ application uh, I have not tested. Uh, Fortran and Python together, and uh, uh, the the support is actually quite mature. But I have not tested either of these yet on Perlmutter, so uh, I'm I expect to do that shortly, and I don't expect any problems there. But I want to give you that caveat. Uh, so as I was saying, you can debug Python, mixed Python and C plus plus applications, but it's really the 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 main debugging that you can do is in C plus plus and C. You can set breakpoints and. Uh, and step through C and C++ code, you can see Python stack frames, but you can't set breakpoints or step through it there. So I want to give you that caveat. Also, uh, you'll we'll look at memory debugging today and how you can use TotalView to look for, uh, to find out why your program is leaking memory, why pointers are dangling, why you're overrunning your buffers. Uh, we support, uh, there's a great deal of scripting that you can do in total view so that you can run your, you can run analysis in an automated fashion. You can, a lot of batch debugging that you can do with total view in a way, ways to automate, uh, automate even the interactive tasks that you, that you have. Uh, and it supports, uh, uh it doesn't support windows. Uh, friends don't let use, win friends don't let friends use windows. So I think that's okay. Uh, but it does uh, comprehensively support Linux, Mac, and several flavors of Unix. Uh, let's see, the remote client, uh, we, we did re just introduce uh, a version of TotalView. I said that TotalView doesn't debug Windows applications. I wasn't lying. Uh, we But we did introduce a remote client for Windows. So if you're using Windows and you want to debug an application running on your desktop, on your Mac, or you, you would probably just run TotalView there directly. But if you wanted to debug an application running on Perlmutter and you have a Windows desktop, then you can run the TotalView GUI on Windows and access uh, Perlmutter that way. And uh, there's some more updates here. I don't think they're that that important for us right now. So, but yeah, we have we've we're, we're continually improving Total View. We do about four releases per year, and recently we've improved the assembly view that uh, you have. So when you don't have source code, or if you want to look at the the assembly level, the assembly version of your program while you're debugging, you've got the capability to do that. You can see registers, as I mentioned. You've got. Uh, complex visualizations of C++ containers that uh, you have available to you. You can also write your own visualizations and plug those into total view. So for your complex data types, you can simplify them for display inside of the debugger. Uh, we've improved our support for visualizing arrays uh, and for the latest versions of Apple hardware. And we're continually adding to our memory debugging suite. So total view memory debugging. Let's talk a little bit about it. Let me move some things around here. Uh, 
Whoops. What just happened? How did we get so far ahead? My, this is running on its own. Pardon me for a sec here. I've just got to get my, get my uh, present, presenter to stop going crazy here. Are you going to stay there now? Good. Uh, so, Total View Memory Debugging. What the devil is happening here? I must, what have I turned on? It, it just wants to go on its own. Maybe if you uh, get out of presentation mode, it might uh, might not automatically advance. I really don't want to do that right now, John. Oh, so, okay. But uh, let, let's see. What if I just click here? No, no, we're there. The... I'm a little puzzled here. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment here. Gonna sit down three times and say a magic spell and see if that improves things. Okay, I'm just gonna hold my mouth down. Wow, this is really something. Yeah, I am starting to feel like a complete goofball right now. So let's swap screens. Uh, well, okay, I'm, I'm just going to have to go ahead and issue. Uh, can everybody still hear me fumbling around here? Yes? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Good, great. So, uh, memory bugs, uh, uh, you know, the memory is a, a fraught part of your application. You, uh, you're going to find, uh, you're, you're going to find issues, uh, I expect in memory when you have complex, uh, complex applications. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, allocating memory from the heap is uh, such an issue that in high risk applications, defense applications, uh, medical devices, uh, autonomous driving, uh, the use of uh, heap allocation is is restricted is often severely restricted. And uh, uh, I've worked with lots of developers who adhere to coding standards like the MISRA standard, which is a an embedded software coding standard that uh, prohibits uh, allocation from the heap. Uh, and uh, they have to if they want to allocate memory on the heap, they have to document every case, every document every exception. Uh, so uh, a lot can go wrong. It's important to be careful that you've got lots of issues that can arise when you're if you have a, a an inst a place in your in your program where you allocate memory and you don't free it later on. Then that if that location is called repeatedly, as they often are in most programs, including simulations, you can run out of memory and your program will crash, or maybe you'll just cause your performance to grade. Uh, you uh, you may free your in, in your program you'll you'll be allocating memory and freeing memory you'll be freeing blocks but after you free that block that pointer is still available if you don't zero out that pointer or get rid of it or, or write your program carefully you may wind up uh, 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 dereferencing that pointer and uh, now you're dereferencing a block that's no longer belongs to you your operating system is probably going to complain and crash your program and give you a seg fault because of that uh, and then of course there's the, the there's the fact that the, the possibility of of writing past the end or re write, reading or writing past the end of your buffer uh, when you allocate it you you if, if you pay attention to the news uh, security violate there are uh, uh, exploit exploits in many different programs and operating systems that attackers take advantage of that involve this kind of problem that involve memory corruption where you you uh, you are able to read where a program allows access to data outside of the buffer that it's supposed to. These are all bad problems. And 
uh, total view is here to help you uh, overcome them, to help you to, well, to, to get rid of them, to purge them from your program. Uh, the way total view works is the, the way memory debugging works is, is that uh, we have a, a tool that we call the HIA, the heap interposition, interposition agent, and it is linked with your program. Uh, it's a, a little library that gets linked automatically with your program when you launch it with total view. Uh, and it sort of proxies the, the malloc API, uh, it proxies malloc and C alloc and free and then and keeps track of the memory that you're allocating. Uh, and uh, when it, so that it can report on how much memory is used and where it's used and whether you have leaked memory and things like that. And it, it's quite efficient. It adds a very small amount of overhead generally to your program. Uh, and it, it does use a little bit of memory itself, but that's usually a pretty small amount. Uh, just an illustration here, the, the, this is the way your program looks before, uh, uh, well, normally, right, you've got your code and it's using malloc and free and to yeah. allocate memory. Uh, when you, even if you're debugging with total view and you don't turn memory on, that's how it looks. But if you turn memory debugging on, then we insert this, as I said, the HIA there, uh, and it proxies those calls to malloc and does it, uh, does it work? <laughs> Hey, Larry, just quick interrupt. I, sure. I started sharing. Did you want to share your screen? Are the slides behaving for you now or what? Am I not sharing right now? Have I been talking to without? Any... Well, I've been, you weren't sharing, but I started sharing. So why don't you share again so that yeah. what you're saying is in sync with the slides. That makes more sense. I think you might have to be out of presentation mode to get it to work. They... I have been. Yeah, I, I think there's a problem. I was seeing the same problem you were seeing. So there's some problem with the slides. I don't know what they are. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Uh, what are you going to do? So uh, I'm. Uh, I I was I was talking about memory bugs, and then we were talking about the HIA, the heap interposition agent. Here we are. Uh, let's see. Uh, a brief, uh, just a, a look at the the memory debugging API. You're seeing my notes here down at the bottom. This is the this is the information that I never want to, to, to show on screen when I'm presenting. This is just for me, and that's why I love presenter view. And uh, I don't have it now, so now you're seeing me with my cheeks bright red, I hope. Uh, the, uh, the, th this is a, a very small and hard to read look at a uh, view of the total UI. You'll get a better one shortly when I demo it for you. Uh, uh, but uh, the functionality that we have today in Total View includes the ability to detect memory leaks, to look for dangling pointers. Uh, you'll get uh, you can you can see an overview of what's allocated uh, on the heap. Uh, in the future, you'll be able to see a more graphical view of what heap allocation what, what your heap allocation looks like. Uh, we can detect. Um, memory corruption using a tool called guard blocks. Uh, I'm going to demo guard blocks for you. Guard blocks allow you to put a little bit of memory before uh, before and after every block that you allocate. Total view will expand the allocation itself. So when you ask for 20K of memory, it'll actually ask for 20K plus eight bytes before and eight bytes after. So it'll ask for 20,000 plus there well 20k plus 8 bytes uh, plus 16 bytes it'll write a uh, it writes a, a characteristic memory pattern a characteristic byte pattern rather in those two little guard blocks and if your program writes past before the beginning of that uh, array before the beginning of that block or past the end of it uh, it will uh, it will overwrite that characteristic 8 byte signature and then total view will detect that a little bit later and report that you have uh, corrupted your memory. Uh, so that's what we have now. There are other tools that we have for more comprehensive uh, buffer overflow memory corruption detection. We call there's a tool called Red Zones. We are uh, moving that into our into our Total View user interface. Uh, uh, so maybe a good time to note that Total View has been around for quite a long time. It has uh, we have a uh, an interface uh, that we think is modern and easy to use. Uh, we also have uh, what I call the legacy UI, which has been around for a very long time. Uh, uh, we, we there is still functionality in the legacy UI that isn't that uh, isn't yet available in the modern UI. If you do read about it and you want it, or you want to hear more about it and you want to use it, you can uh, consult me. Uh, as I said before, 
uh, but we are busy moving everything that we have into our modern UI. Uh, recently, we've moved tools like memory block painting and memory hoarding there, which you can use for uh, diagnosing other issues in your application. And then uh, we, uh, we also expect to add a, a, a tool in our modern UI to be able to compare uh, memory usage between different between the same process running on different machines or between the two snapshots of the same process so that you can see how memory has changed over time. And I think that is now a good time to go to our demo. How are we doing on time? So we're 930. Yeah, okay. I think we're doing all right. Uh, let me stop sharing this screen now. And so Larry, yeah, there's a question. Please. Yeah. Uh, what mechanism does does the heap interceptor use? LD preload. Does it work with the user space allocators like uh, TC malloc or MIM malloc? So, the HIA will will track memory that ultimately tracks memory that goes through the malloc API through uh, uh, through malloc alloc and free. Um, Let's see, TC Alloc. John, can you can you speak? To well, that? yeah, yes. Yeah. So it uses LD preload, and what it does is um, it defines. You know, it loads itself before other libraries in your program, specifically libc, or if you've got a special allocator. As long as the allocator that you have follows the malloc API, so it defines malloc, free, realloc, calloc, and you know all the. Um, all of the um, uh, hooks, then TotalView really doesn't know the difference between interposing um, Libc's uh, malloc or any other malloc. Um, but if you've got if you've got special functions that you use and they're not named malloc and free, then TotalView won't hook those. Thanks, John. Okay. I'm gonna boost on any any other questions right now. No. All right, then I'm gonna share my screen again. And I'm gonna share the debugger here. So you should see my Linux VM here now. You're still seeing your slides. Still seeing the slides. There you go. Great. So this is my Linux VM running on my local Mac here. And uh, I'm connected to, uh, I've got, I've got total view running right now. This is just a, a blank screen here uh, in, in between applications here in total view. Uh, and I've got a couple terminals here and I should still have an allocation. I don't know, it just looks like uh, have I lost my allocation here? All right, so I'm surprised. I thought I had grabbed one for two hours, but uh, okay, we'll grab it again. If we lose it in the middle, we'll grab it again. And we're going to run a little program that we have that helps illustrate some of the issues that can arise with Total View that, that you can capture with Total View. That's great. Uh, let's see. I'll run a new, run a new instance here. Pull up the last. Oh boy, that, my history is no looking. No, doesn't look fun there. So let's see if we can get things started. Uh, Um, this and we should be waiting here. So you forgot uh, the S run command, uh, Larry. Oh yeah, I did. Even my keyboard is is uh, 
is foiling me now. The demo gods are not kind today. No, no, you need to say TV Connect S run. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's good someone here. Still running. So uh, I had configured Total View on my desktop to accept a reverse connection from from uh, from Perlmutter. And I'm going to accept that reverse connection now. So uh, we've started we, we've started to debug a program right now. That program is S run. Uh, and Total View has given us a chance to to run this program. And if uh, the demo gods are with us, then when I run it, it's going to launch uh, the real program we want to debug, which is this little program filter app. And it'll give us uh, a chance to to stop that job uh, and uh, and start uh, looking for things. Um, uh, I forgot to start memory debugging. Dang it. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop our job, and and start again. And I'm also going to uh, let me get back to my start page here. Let me load my yes yes yes. You're quite right. <laughs> so uh, uh, on my desktop here, I'm loading the application. I'm letting it know which application I'm debugging so that the code is ready. Uh, I've turned on memory debugging here. Uh, we have a small control panel here that you can use to, to perform a few of the actions that, uh, that, uh, you're, that are available on memory debugging. Uh, you can also configure uh, the you configure a number of different things in memory debugging. Uh, what I've configured right now is to stop uh, when memory events occur. So when total view catches uh, uh, buffer overflows uh, and some other some other uh, some other problems, total view will stop your program and put up a, a a box indicating that. And then I've also turned on guard blocks. And so as I mentioned, there's a there's a little eight byte block that's gonna you're going, that is going to be allocated before every buffer, an eight byte block that's going to be allocated after the the early the 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 before buffer is going to be painted with this hexadecimal pattern here, and the after buffer with this pattern. But if you wanted to, you could change these, and you could change these sizes and these patterns. So I'm happy with that, and I should still have reverse connect turned on. No, I don't, so I'm turning on reverse connections. So I'll be waiting for my reverse connection. And once again, we will, we will, what, why is that? We will beseech the demo gods to be kind to us and run our program. Here we go. So we've loaded the program. Uh, the program is S run right now. We're going to hit go so that uh, we can uh, get to the. Did you intend to enable memory debugging on this one? I did, and did I, did I somehow know? When did it go? Oh my goodness. Ugh. One more time. Memory debugging is enabled. Well, that's a local instance. Right. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. I have to. Check it now, there we go. Thank you. I have seen a problem on Perlmutter where S run takes a very long time to launch a program under the debugger. I don't understand what it is, but I've seen the sometimes it S run executes immediately, you know, within a second or two, and sometimes it can take upwards of a minute. I don't know why. I've seen that also, but I, I am also a little suspicious of my uh, of 
starting and stopping programs from I you know uh, that shouldn't make a difference. I don't think so. If you halt it, you can see where it is. I mean it's just it's just that's when it's just the process, right? Yeah. So it's somewhere so what what create I... time out. Yeah. So just let it run, it'll finish it. What I, what I hit there was I hit halt, uh, which stopped the program wherever it happens to be executing at the moment. You can see the call stack here uh, in the call stack view, you know, where main is still, uh, is still S runs code as far as we're concerned. And then we're somewhere in this stack here, but we're just gonna, we're gonna hit go and let things run. And hopefully we'll see, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see that, uh, the application will stop once it gets to uh, just before the beginning of our actual program, and we'll have a chance to set some breakpoints there and actually see some debugging. I'm going to close some of these windows here. We could have looked at the assembly view of those stack frames here, but I don't think that's particularly useful. I'm feeling superstitious, John, and I'm gonna we'll just race hit. Oop, there it goes. No, that was that was me hitting. Oh, you killed it. Okay, that was me killing it. Well, just show it local then. I'm gonna give this one more shot here because I think we have the I think we have the order down correctly now. So I'm gonna can we I think uh, Wusan showed you a connection dialog for connecting to Perlmutter. I'm gonna show you that configuration here. Uh, this is the same configuration so earlier. And we're going to activate it as before. We're connected to Perlmutter. Load that same session. Debugging. There we go. I predict big success now. Don't let me down. Can you run without SRAM? Um, that might be wise. Yeah, TV Connect. Uh, uh, what, what is it? The filter yeah. app. Yeah. So we'll run it without SRAM. Yeah. We did get a, we did get a message there, indicating that things were delayed. This is not an MPI code, right? So, this is not a what? Not an MPI code. That's right. This is right. very simple code here. Right. So now that we're running directly, we're running the application directly instead of duress on. Totally, just loads for us the the code that we're actually running and gives us a chance to set breakpoints, which is what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to turn on memory debugging here. And I'm going to set a little breakpoint. Let's see, how about here in corrupt data? So I'm going to hit run, and we, we should quite quickly get to the breakpoint that I just set. Did I, did I get it? Did I hit run there? Yes, I did. There we go. So uh, we've, stopped, uh, we've stopped at this breakpoint here. Uh, uh, and th this is toy code that's here just to, sh to illustrate uh, memory corruption. So we've got uh, a few pointers here. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna allocate point we're gonna allocate those pointers a few different times, and we're gonna we're gonna overflow a buffer here. Uh, let, let me let's double check to see that uh, we have guard blocks allocated. Now we have guard blocks allocated, and 
uh, every time we malloc here, let's see, we're allocating size, size is 16, and the size of an inch should be four. Uh, and so we're gonna allocate 64 bytes, but we're gonna, when we, we're gonna then go and write into, we're gonna write over, write into that memory some meaningless values, but we're gonna, we're gonna write one past the end of this buffer. And what we're gonna see is that, uh, well, we're, we're going to see a message here shortly uh, indicating that total views, when we get to, to free here, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, let me set a breakpoint here at I, uh, and we'll let, uh, we'll let this pointless allocation loop run here until we get to uh, line 121. Now, what should have happened uh, at this point is that the, uh, the one of these buffers, uh, the buffer p1 here should have been overridden and if i when we total view can't catch directly when you're writing to memory that's uh, outside of your buffer but it can notice it once uh, total view has control again and that happens when you call free and the heap interposition agent is called so if i hit go now then we get a memory error here. So uh, we've uh, our program is stopped, and we've got uh, a notification here of that from Total View this event report here, noting that uh, a guard block got uh, got corrupted. You've got information here uh, uh, about the block itself. Here is where here here are the the address of the block is sixty four byte block here. Uh, we've got uh, we can see that the the pre guard so the the guard before the block of memory it hasn't been hasn't been overwritten but the block after after it was overwritten the what you can what you can do now uh, you can find out where that where total view detected the the issue right by clicking in this backtrace here so uh, I want to show you that again so there there are two backtraces here available one that shows you where the the uh, Error was detected, and where the the buffer that was uh, that was corrupted, where that was allocated. So, by opening the event location backtrace, I can take a look at it, the stack trace uh, there. So we're inside of main, inside of our dubiously named corrupt data uh, function, and here on line one twenty four is where we detected the issue. And then if I move over to the allocation. Uh, stack trace, I can see that we're inside of corrupt data and the allocation happened as we suspected here uh, on this line, on line 108, where we out, where P1 is allocated. And, and, and then we can, as before, we have views of the, of the stack trace at the moment. Right now we're in a, you can see in the stack trace here that we're deep, we're deep in, in some Total view. We, we're we've called free. Then our HIA is called, and then there's some other HIA plumbing here. So uh, that's what that means there. So we've seen. Uh, this is one example of how you can catch memory issues with Total View. We've looked. This we've catch. We've caught a memory corruption here. We've caught it a little bit after it happened. Right. We know that the corruption happened. Almost certainly in this loop here, because that's what that's what we wrote the code to do. We weren't able to catch that corruption directly when it happened, but we caught it shortly after when memory was freed, and uh, that's a that that should be quite useful to you uh, when when you're trying to catch buffer overflows. Uh, we will introduce, uh, as I noted earlier, some functionality called uh, which we call red zones later, which will allow you to catch uh, illegal writes and reads exactly when they happen at some significant more cost, a higher cost to the performance of your application. Uh, so you may find both of these techniques useful at different times, but for today, that's the technique we have any, that we have available. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer? Yeah, Larry, I think you can use the uh, red zone feature from the command line. If you drop into the command line level, then you can, yeah. You use dheap. There's a uh, you can set up. Uh, you can set that up. It's all described in the documentation. The features there. It's just there's um, 
no user interface for it right now, and we'll be developing the uh, um, the interface in the new UI shortly. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, the, John's note, the importance of it can't be overstated. Uh, the command line here, this is a, a total view command line. There are uh, quite a lot of commands available. Everything that you can do with total view is available through a command line. So, uh, and you can actually run the, you can run total view without the, all of this graphic, uh, without all of, all of this UI. And you can, you can run an executable called total view CLI, which is really just the command line and do everything there. If you're a, a GDB power user, and like to use GDB uh, from the command line to debug your applications, you'll have that same, you'll have very similar capability from the TotalView command line, but with uh, with everything that TotalView gives you for, for memory debugging and for, of course, for, for visualizing and dealing with uh, multiple processes and multiple threads. Right, and, this, and the CLI is a, um, is a tickle interpreter. So you can write tickle scripts to program it to, you know, to do whatever you want it to do. So I think that's great here. I'm going to stop the program now from here on Total View, and I want to show you something else. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to we're going to load that same program, but we're going to go to a different portion, a different part of that program. And first, I'm going to have to make a little change to it while it's running. So I will show you that. Let me, I know that's a little cryptic right now, but let me run this program again. We'll connect to a different part of it. So we'll turn on memory debugging again, but I don't want to call that function here that's going to crash my, um, that's going to crash the program here, this, uh, this uh, horribly named corrupt data function here. So I'm going to create uh, a little breakpoint here, which just says, um, which I know I would, we want to, I'm going to tell it to go to the next line of code here. Uh, John, am I doing that right there? Yep, that should work. Yep. Right. So uh, in, I've created something that's like breakpoint. I've created an evaluation point. Total view will get control for a second. It will see that ah, here's uh, the user wants me to skip to this line in, in the application and it will do it and it'll skip around all that nasty stuff there. Uh, and instead we'll get to, uh, let, when do I, let's stop, um, let's stop uh, over here. Running. That's great. So we've uh, skipped over that uh, that routine, and now we're here in where we're going to look at some memory allocation. And we'll take a look at some some uh, uh, we'll take a look at some total view features here. So we're we're just going to allocate memory in a loop here, and we're gonna we're gonna leak some of this memory here. I'm gonna step through a little bit. We'll see how quickly we can step through it. We'll see how quickly the the, the turnaround from uh, the remote system is it's pretty leisurely it looks like but we did get to the next line of code uh, as always we've got our call stack here and then over here in the info view view i can see uh, local variables and i can see them organized into blocks let's drag one over here so i'm gonna i'm gonna just take a, a variable i which is declared here on the stack and be able and and uh, drag it over here and then there's another pointer there's a pointer alloc2 i'm going to drag it over here right now you can see that uh, that these are these values are empty or they're, they're initialized to zero so what this loop does is it uh it uh, executes uh, 24 times and each time it allocates a little bit of memory my malloc is a function that just wraps malloc and it, uh, I wouldn't worry about uh, this part here. It's going to allocate some moderate amount of memory, you know, 10, 20, 30 bytes. And, and it's going to keep freeing these buffers, but every fifth time it's going to fail to free the buffer, right? So 
whenever uh, uh, whenever the uh, uh, i modulo five is zero, it's going to skip the it's going to skip the free here. And I think let's see how can I I'm going to I'm going to step a couple times just so you can see uh, how the how the the data views get updated. So I hit step here. We're going to allocate this buffer in just a second. <coughs> Okay. Oh, so we we went we stepped through my malloc and malloc, uh, alloc two here. The pointer in the, the data view is visible, and you can see that we have allocated memory here. I can also take a look at all of the memory that's been allocated. So I'm, I'm going to do that by generating a heap report here. This is a slightly complex view here. I'm going to give it enough room so that we can look at. It. Uh, the, 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 every heap allocation that the, every, every bit of, uh, heap that's currently allocated is, is visible here. Uh, at the top level, we have processes. There's only one process in this, uh, in this group of processes. So we've only just got this one top level instance here. And then we've got the different places the, the, where memory has been allocated. Uh, we have our source code here. We have some some of the runtime libraries that are linked in with our source code. Uh, the ones that I'm interested in are in uh, in main, if I remember correctly. So if I select uh, if I select uh, any of these nodes here, the backtrace pane here changes to show all of the allocations uh, that are that are now currently selected. If I select main, I can see five backtraces. If I Drill down a little bit here. Uh, I can see a little bit more information. Uh, so here now we're, we can see where memory is allocated by function, and it, in this case, my malloc, I believe, is what we're looking for. And we're able to see, as I mentioned, there is this function my malloc which wraps malloc, and on line 31, memory is allocated here, and it was just a little a 10 byte buffer. And if there were multiple allocations, which there will be later, you'd see multiple, but we can, uh, if I select that block here and uh, open up my backtrace, I can see the, 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 the call stack when that allocation was made. So here I am in main, and then here I am in my alloc, my malloc, and then below that is malloc. If I step a little bit further, let me get back to where my program is actually running. Let's let's step forward one line here, so you can see what a dangling pointer looks like. So we're we're going to deallocate this buffer now. I'm going to step one more time, and we're going to go back to the top of our loop, and we're going to see that now that the Buffer pointed to by alloc two was freed. We now uh, paint this uh, we, in the UI here. We we paint this as a dangling pointer because the buffer has been freed and we still have a pointer to it, and that's a good thing. I'm going to let this run a few more times and set a breakpoint here. Actually, Larry, a uh, a dangling pointer is you have a uh, a uh, a pointer. To memory that has been freed, is, is that not what I said? Well, maybe that's not what I heard. Sorry. Mm, I, I, that, that is what I meant. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, John is right. So a dangling pointer is a pointer that points to something to a block that was previously allocated but is now freed. Right. Quite right. Uh, thanks for clarifying. Uh, and I'm gonna hit go here so that we can. Uh, let uh, let a few more allocations happen. Let a, you know, a few more allocations. Let well and let a few of them leak. Uh, and we've got to the end. We've got to our breakpoint here. Uh, the heap up the heap report doesn't update uh, automatically. It updates when on demand. Uh, a few other details here. So I you know we've now passed beyond the scope of this for loop where I was declared, and so we're noting that this is not a good value anymore. I'm going to remove I from from our view here. And 
let's take a look at the heap. So I'm, I'm uh, running uh, update to take a look at the heap report here. Uh, we've got, again, this is a, a, a fairly dense report here, but uh, and I look forward to the graphical version of it. But we can see now that we've got four different allocations here. The count is four uh, 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 from this one location, which we looped through uh, several times. Uh, we have, um, uh, let's see. We have, we have four allocations left and they're about to leak. So let's let them, let's run our leak. Actually, they should have, we should have leaked. So I'm gonna run my leak report now. So I've hit the teardrop here and I can take a look at all the memory that's leaked. And if I select, uh, if I open up, we do have a, a number of leaks in this program. The ones that we are focusing on are the ones that happened uh, in that uh, little loop that I showed you, uh, again, in my, in my malloc. And so we have three leaks. Remember that we went through that loop 24 times and we leaked it on, we leaked memory on, uh, uh, let's see, on the fifth uh, iteration, the 10th iteration, the 15th iteration. We also leaked it on the 20th iteration, and, but we won't have seen, we won't see that for just a minute here. I can take a look at the blocks that have been leaked here. I can select any of these and look at the backtrace. And it's going to be the same as you saw before earlier, where we know where we're leaking. We're leaking here on line 31. I uh, believe that we will see one more, however, uh, when we uh, when we uh, exit this function here, if I remember correctly. And so I'm going to things go one more time here. Uh, yeah, so we've, we've, that, that pointer, uh, that last pointer uh, has gone out of scope. And now that that pointer is out of scope, that memory is effectively leaked. And so we now have one more buffer here that's been leaked. So we have, after we've gone from three to four, we have four of these buffers here. And again, they're, they're all in the same place. They're, you can see the size of the buffers that were allocated. You see they're a little bit different each time, uh, but uh, they're all leaks just the same. So that is everything that I was planning on showing you in memory debugging. Uh, I'm happy to, if, there, if anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them. And if not, hey Larry, um, there was a question about the data view. Um, if you close the data view, how do you get it back? Uh, if you close it, you can go to views here and pull it up. Great, right. thanks. Sure. John, I think it might be time to turn it over to you. Okay, sure. So, we'd like to take a, a quick break. Yeah, that sounds uh, good. Yeah, about the uh, we get back at ten ten. Five minute break. How about that? Perfect. All right. You're the best.